Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Paradise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So glad to see you all on this wonderful, blessed second Sunday morning for our morning word. I'm just so excited about you being here and just sharing with us as we are getting ready to minister right here from our virtual sanctuary. Uh, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to share. I want you to like. I want you to comment. I want to I want to see some interactions today. Amen. Because, of course, with us not being in the physical sanctuary, your amens and your prayers and your witnesses go a long way. So it's just a blessing to have those comments and those thumbs up as we share the word of God on today. And I don't know about you, but I'm just so excited. Anytime I get a chance to just come before God's people and share a word that's going to bless your life. I just get excited. I just get overjoyed on the inside and it just blesses my spirit and I truly believe that God has a word for you today amen and we're just going to shift gears here this morning if you don't mind um, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles turn with me in your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the gospel according to John we're going to go to John chapter 5 today and in John chapter 5, I want to read those first nine verses in John chapter 5, St. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Amen. If you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, go ahead and fake it. Here's the word of our God. Verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. I'm going to stop right there for a moment and I'm going to just speak for a few moments from the subject. Triumph over a lame life. Triumph over a lame life here we have in our text this morning john's account of another miraculous act that was performed by jesus which took place in jerusalem at this pool called bethesda uh, and that's the word bethesda that is what it means in aramaic and the definition of the word uh, bethesda basically means house of mercy it's a reservoir uh, it's, it's considered a swimming bath. And this pool consisted of five porches close to the sheep gate or the market. And it seems that in this case here that for select few, these particular porches were very special. Uh, according to scripture, at a certain time, at a certain season, an angel would descend into the pool of Bethesda and stir the waters. And when this event occurred, the very first person that could get from the porch to the pool was healed. And while that may have been a blessing to the one person who got in, it only left disappointment for everybody else who was waiting and desperate for healing. But verse 5 points out something very special. It points out this man in particular who the Bible says he had been crippled for 38 years. And what Jesus does here is that he seeks this man out and he approaches him and he asks him the question, do you want to get well? If you read it in the New King James, I'm sorry, if you read in the King James translation, it says something like, will thou be made whole? And what I want to do for a few moments this morning, I just want us to look 
at these components um, of this particular story as we talk about triumphing over a lame life. And, and I know that many of you all who are watching this morning, who are on this live, you're probably thinking, well, Pastor, this is going to be a good message for me because I've been, I found myself in lame situations. Because how many of you know that, you, <clears throat> excuse me, how many of you know that you don't always have to be uh, physically lame, but many of us have suffered or are suffering from spiritual lameness. And, and here we have an anecdote. Here we have uh, the ingredients. Here we have something that can help us to get out of the lame state that we're in. And, and I want you to follow me as we look at this text today because there, there are three main things that I want to point out to us today as we, as we uh, move forward in this particular subject. The first thing we see here is we look at this multitude, the multitude. Here it is in the text right here, verses three and four. It says right here, it says that in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So, so when we look at the, the multitude of people who were waiting and trying to get in this water, the first thing we see here is they were wretched. They were wretched. Their bodies were twisted. They were sick. And they were indeed just a group that was not in a good state physically. Uh, in their sickness, they embody the picture of a sinner in all of his helplessness, uselessness and blindness. And even though a lost person might be healthy in their body, they are still sick in the soul and they're still separated from God. So here you have a group of people who who wanted healing. They were they were wretched. They were they were not physically in a good state. But not only were they wretched, but they were also waiting. They were waiting. They were waiting on this particular angel to come down and, and, and trouble um, and, and, and get into the water, rather. Well, no, they waited on the angel to come down so they could get into the water and be healed. And, and yet, even while they waited, here it is. And this is what really blessed me right here, because even though they were waiting for this angel to come down, into that water the great physician was already on the scene and he was passing by and nobody even realized it and see that's the danger many times when many of us are trying to look for uh, some type of satisfaction many of us are, are trying to look for uh, some type of, of solution to our issue and oftentimes we're looking in the wrong direction and when we look in the wrong direction oftentimes we'll miss the, the, the true uh, answer of our problem we'll miss the true uh, solution to our issue it, Jesus was walking by he, it says right here he was he was already there and many of them did not even realize it and oftentimes we look for everything under the sun to fill the voids in our lives all the while Jesus is passing by unnoticed unheard and unheeded and basically it's almost like that song that says looking for love in all the wrong places i know i got some witnesses that know that you've been in a situation before where you were looking for love in all the wrong places you were looking for affection in all the wrong places you were looking for healing in all the wrong places you were looking for answers in all the wrong places but here the answer was already right there at their reach but they didn't know it and so we got to be careful church to not fall in the same trap as the multitude did. We have to be careful not to take on the same mindset and mentality that there's some, some type of healing power, some type of thing that can rescue us, some type of thing that can deliver us that, 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 that is in something that really doesn't have any power. And when we're looking at something that doesn't have power, we miss the true source of power. So yeah, we see, we see here, we see here in the text that that, yeah, the, the multitude, we see, we first of all have to take a look at the multitude. But, but not only do we need to take a look at the multitude, but what we also need to do is we have to look at the man. We have to look at the man, the crippled man. Here it is, verses 5 through 7. It says, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 
when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now, 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 let's look at this. Let's look at this because and I'm going to stop right there for a second because we see this man in the text is disabled. We see that he has to be carried everywhere that he goes. We see that he is forced to beg his way all through life and he is completely helpless to those around him. Anybody who knows that when you are caring sometimes for a disabled person or if you know a disabled person and it's not to say anything in a derogatory sense but sometimes disabled people are often they're helpless they can't help themselves and oftentimes they can't help you. And this was the position this man was in. He was disabled and he was also desperate. And he, here it is. He was he, right here. This man who if the angel did not come, he would have to try to drag his own body across the porch to get into the pool. See, he didn't have a wheelchair. He didn't have a motorized scooter. He couldn't get in touch with with uh, with Medicaid and, and Medicare to get certain things that he needed to get around. He would literally have to drag himself from that porch that he was on to the pool in order to get to where the angel was supposedly going to come down. So we see that this man was disabled. We see that he was desperate. But we also see that he was disappointed. He was often disappointed. And time and time again, this man had seen others get into the pool ahead of him. Time and time again, his dreams of a complete whole life were crushed. Time and time again, he was forced to drag his broken body back to his old mat and yet wait for another opportunity, another time of disappointment. And how many of us have ever been in a situation where we were like this man? Time and time again, we're, we're sitting there, we're, we're, we're disabled. Many of us are spiritually disabled. Many of us may be emotionally disabled where we can't really help ourselves, we can't really help others, and we're in desperate situations situations and you know how many know that sometimes desperate situations call for desperate measures and in this man's mind this was considered a desperate measure but even though he was there and he was dragging himself he had been by that pool the bible says for 38 years and here he is dragging himself to that pool trying to wait for the angel to come down into the water but yet other people kept getting in front of him to watch this because the text says in verse 7 now, let's go back, because at the end of verse six, Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? Do you want to be made well? Will thou be made whole? That's what Jesus is asking the man here. But watch this. In verse seven, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another one steps down before me. Now, one thing I did notice about this man here is he, we noticed that he uh, was making excuses. Jesus asked one question. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? That's what I want to know. Do you want to get well? Now, he could either say yes or no. But instead of that, here it is. This man is just giving all the excuses as to why he couldn't get into the water. And how many of us are like that today? Here we are knowing that that healing is made available to us, that deliverance is made available to us. It's right there um, at our disposal. But yet when we're asked the question, do you want this healing? Do you want deliverance? We're always making excuses as to why we can't do it. Do you want to get healed from high blood pressure? Well, you know, my mama had it. Grandma had it. My great grandma had it. Do you want to get healed? from diabetes well you know it's been running my family for years uh you know i've had this for so many years and my child was just diagnosed with it you know this was going on and i'm sure in the back of jesus mind he was probably thinking i didn't ask you all that i did not ask you all that i asked you a simple question do you want to get well and where this man messed up right here is he allowed his condition to become his position Help me, Holy Ghost. He allowed his condition to become his position. See, when you've been in a condition for so long, you just get conditioned to be in that way. Uh, I never shall forget. Uh, I, was, uh, you know, uh, I was driving my truck one time, and the, the engine light came on. 
it says, you know, service engine soon. And but I'm still driving it. And I just kept on driving. I said, OK, it's running OK. Um, don't necessarily, you know, hear anything clunking, you know, uh, in, the, in the engine. So I'm just going to keep on driving it. And before I knew it, about two months had gone by. And here I was driving a truck with the engine light on. Now, what are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is that the condition, and let me tell you, the condition that the truck was in, once I finally went to get it fixed, here it was. The truck, um, uh, my, my radiator had gone bad. And the radiator needed to be replaced. So here I am driving a truck with a bad radiator all this time and then finally after two almost three months I decided to go ahead and get it fixed so what I did in that instance was I was allowing the condition of my truck to become a position I got used to getting in and seeing the engine light on I got used to going wherever I was going and seeing the engine light on you know and even knowing in the back of my mind that eventually if I keep driving this thing and this engine light stays on eventually something's gonna happen to where it's gonna be it's gonna cost a whole lot to get it fixed so let me go ahead and start not turn this uh condition into a position and many of you all right now are in a state or in a condition where it's almost going to become your position. And a lot of times, once it becomes a position, it's a lot harder to get out of when it was a condition. Y'all missed that. Oftentimes, when things become a position, it's a lot harder to get out of when it's a condition. They say three times a charm. I'm going to try this one more time. Oftentimes, when we are in a position, it makes it harder for us to get out of it than when it was a condition and my question is what condition are you in this morning where are you right now what what condition are you in this are, are, are you are you just constantly sick are you constantly depressed are you constantly going through family problems financial problems? what is your condition we've got to be careful not to be like this man and allow a condition to become position I don't care what anybody says if you've been lame for 38 years that's no longer really a condition that is a position think about it you don't believe me come here woman with the issue of blood here it was for 12 long years she was bleeding and she just constantly constantly for 12 years and it got to a point I, I can assume that that if she was bleeding that long she just got used to it but one day the Bible says she heard that Jesus was passing by and she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment why was that because she got tired of the condition that she was in that became a position so she wanted to do something about it so here it is that Jesus is offering to do something about this man's condition that he was in he says will thou be made whole do you want to get well are you tired of being disabled are you tired of being in this desperate situation are you tired of being disappointed I just want to know do you want to get well do you want to be made whole or do you just want to stay like this I'm talking about triumph over a lame life. But not only, church, do we see the, the multitude. Not only must we also look at the man, but the good thing is we need to learn how to look at the Messiah. My God, my God today. We need to learn how to look at the Messiah. Here it is in the text, verses 8 and 9. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the Bible says the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, now, what do we see here with Jesus? First of all, we see that Jesus has compassion on this man. We see that we see it and it's seen in three different ways. First of all, Jesus chose him out of all the other people that were out there in that multitude. Jesus could have stopped at anybody's bedside. He could have stopped at anybody's mat. He could have stopped at anybody's cot. But he chose to stop here. And I don't know about you, but when I think about that, to me, that, said, that, that communicates nothing but pure grace. That's what it communicates because Jesus thought enough of this man to stop by his mat. He's, he, and how many know that a lot of times Jesus, even if you think about the things that you're going through, Jesus will think enough about you to stop by your house. 
Yeah, yeah, he, he'll do it. Even in the midst of, of everything we're going through right now, even in the midst of COVID-19, even in the midst of being in a pandemic, even in the midst of a racial injustice, all these things that are going on, all the houses that have needs, all the, th all the people who have needs in their families, in their finances, in their health, but yet Jesus decides to stop by your house. And you ought to be shouting right now, thanking him that if you've ever been in a situation where Jesus stopped by your house and he could have stopped by anybody else's, you ought to be rejoicing right there where you are. Yeah, yeah. So so we see Jesus compassion and we also see uh, the Messiah's command, his command. Jesus commanded this man, this brother who had not walked in 38 years. He told him to get up, pick up his bed and walk. That's all he told him to do. All that was required of this crippled man was simple childlike faith and obedience to the command of Christ. So the man didn't ask a whole bunch of questions. Like he didn't, he didn't uh, give a whole bunch of excuses. He was like, Lord, didn't I just tell you that I've been in this position all this time? Didn't I just tell you that I've been dragging my lame body to this water and I still can't get what I need. Didn't I tell you that all these folk keep jumping in before me? And here you are telling me to get up and walk. Many times our attitudes and our own positions in, in mentally and emotionally, a lot of times will, will, talk, will, will hinder our healing. It will hinder where we need to be with God. It will hinder what God wants to do in our lives. Many times, you can you know, many people talk about, oh, this ain't nothing but the devil. The devil is stopping me from doing this. Oh, the devil is like Satan, not today. Have you ever stopped to consider oftentimes the biggest devil you got to fight is yourself? I know I've been in positions in my life to where I know that many times I put myself in situations and I could not put the blame on the devil because I talk myself out of my own blessing. I talk myself out of my own miracle. I talk myself out of my own breakthrough. But here, this man right here, Jesus just gave one. He said he gave the command. He said, you know what? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up, take up your bed and walk. That's what that's all Jesus said. That's all he said. And, and, and if you see, according to the text, according to the text, all right, watch this. It says immediately, verse 9, it says, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. So we see the compassion of the Messiah. We see the command of the Messiah, but we also see the control of the Messiah. And the Bible makes it plain that this man was miraculously and instantly healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all Jesus did was spoke a word. Jesus spoke and the man was healed. And all he had to do, church, was to get up and walk away. When Jesus spoke, this man responded by getting up and walking as he was commanded. And Jesus didn't tell the man, OK, you know what? Later on today, I want you to get up and, and walk. I'm, I'm going to let you sit here for a while. No, Jesus, no, right then, right? It didn't, no, it didn't happen a, a couple of hours later, not according to scripture, but right then and there, immediately. That's why you can't read over stuff too fast. The word of God says right in verse nine, it says, and immediately, that means right then, right there, the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And let me say this because we talk about how the man took up his bed. All right, now. When you've been lame and crippled for 38 years, once you get up, you know, you got to do some things. You have to actually, first of all, move your mat. But now that this man was healed, I'm sure nine times out of 10, if he wants to continue to survive, he had to get a job. I'm sure he had to go to work. And see, again, going back to what I said earlier about the position and the condition, many times people end up in uh, conditions that lead to positions and they want to stay there because they don't want the responsibilities that come after they have gotten what they needed. Oh my God. Can I help somebody right here? 
once you get into the place where you need to be, once you are able to move about, once you are able to be made whole, you've got to be ready to do the work that comes after it. And I might not be talking about uh, physical work or, or a job. You know, now, now, if you have, were physically uh, uh, disabled, now you're able to move around. Yeah, you do need to get a job. But, 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 if, you, but if, if you've been spiritually disabled, now that you're able, now you have a responsibility to go and tell others about what you've experienced. And now somebody else can be delivered and somebody else can be brought up. Somebody else can triumph over their lame life simply because of you. So Jesus said, told this man, he said, you know what? Get up and walk. And the man did. And he expected the man to do it right then. And guess what? He did it right then. Aren't you thankful that we serve a God? Aren't you thankful that we have this Jesus Christ, this Messiah who has this type of compassion for us? Aren't you thankful that he no, he cares enough about us that where even when he's my even when other folks might be going through right next to you, you and they they're still going through, but yet he still comes on the scene and he meets you at your point of need before he meets somebody else at there. Aren't you glad that you're that important to? the Lord I don't know about you but I am hallelujah now let me close by saying this Jesus is walking right now through your place through your virtual sanctuary and perhaps he may even be speaking to your heart as you listen to what I've had to share with you today perhaps you might be one of the ones who uh, you're living a lame life. You don't have um, everything that you need physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. You're, you're in that lame state to where you literally have to drag yourself to and fro. For some people, it might be hard for you just to get out of the bed because of the lame state that you're in. But my question to you is this. Jesus is walking through. And he's coming to your cot. He's coming to your mat. He's coming to your house. And he's asking you right now, do you want to be well? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be set free? Do you want to be delivered from that addiction that you're in? He doesn't care how long you've been there. He doesn't care how long you've suffered. He doesn't care how long you've dealt with all the things and all the hell that you've had to deal with. All he wants to know is, do you want to get well? So my question to you is this. What's it going to be? Are you going to continue giving him 101 reasons to why you weren't able to get well initially? Are you going to think of a million reasons to why you can't actually allow Jesus Christ to come into your life and do what he needs to do he's waiting on many of us right now just to obey him just like this man did and get up and walk and come out of that state that we're in and he's able to do it y'all I believe it I know it with all my heart that he's able to do it He's done it for me. He's done it for many of you. And I wish it was somebody here that's on this live right now who can give me a thumbs up and testify and thank him for being able to do what he does. But I'm thankful today that I can triumph over my lame life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, here's what I want to do right now. I want to extend this invitation to Christian discipleship. There might be somebody here who's watching me right now. And you know that you're in a lame state spiritually. You know that you need Christ in your life. I want to give you the opportunity. I want to give you the chance to get to know him in a real and a personal way. He's right here waiting on you. He's asking you right there, just like he did with this man. Do you want to get well? Do you want to have eternal life? And I want to offer and extend that opportunity to you. Also, you might be watching today and you might already be saved, but you might have backslidden. You might have kind of fell, fell out of fellowship with, with the Lord. I want to give you the opportunity right now to rededicate your life to Christ. You can do it right here. 
Also, you might be on this line and you might say, well, I'm saved, but I don't have a church home. I want to invite you right now to unite with our church, to unite with the Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. We are a great fellowship. Our church, the building might be closed, but the church is still open and we're still waiting and ready to receive you. Well, we don't have an aisle to walk down, so how do I join church, Pastor? Here's how you do it. All you have to do is if you desire to join, you can either do it. In the, if you want do, you can do it in the comments. You can type in, I want to join paradise. Or, I, just, I, just, I want to join. That's all you got to say. And we have people that's right here right now in this virtual sanctuary that will contact you and let you know what you need to do. If you don't want to put anything in the comments, that's fine, too. All you got to do is you can go to you can email info at paradise or go to our website, paradisembc.org, click on contact us. Send us a message. Let us know you want to be a part of our fellowship. And we have people that will give you the opportunity or give you the tools that you need to unite with our church. There's some people might be watching me right now. You might have been a member of Paradise for whatever reason years ago. And here we are in this state where nobody can really physically get to their church. Nobody can physically get to the sanctuary where they normally worship. But you know that your heart has always been with Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. And I'm here to say to you right now as the senior pastor, you can come back home. No matter where you are, no matter how long you're gone. The beautiful thing about coming back home now is, you know, you don't have to worry about walking down the aisle. You don't have to worry about people asking you where you've been and all that. You don't have to do all of that because guess what? Everything is virtual now. That's just going to be between you and God. And if people look up and see you when we get back to the sanctuary, they just see you. I'm like, oh, they're home now. But we invite you to come back home if that's you. Now, here's what I want to do right now. I want to pray a prayer with those who are not saved. If you know you need to accept Christ, I want you to bow with me. And I'm going to say this prayer, and I want you to repeat it after me, and I want you to mean it in your heart. Say, Dear God in heaven, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins, and I turn away from them, and I give my life to you. I believe that Jesus is your son, that he died for all my sins, and that you raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would come into my life and save me, guide me, lead me, and teach me to live this Christian life. Right now, I receive you by faith as my Savior and my Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I give my life to you. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it in your heart that you are now saved, you are now part of the fellowship and family of God, now the next thing you ought to do is become a part of a Bible teaching, Bible believing church, wherever that is in your area. And out of obedience to Christ, be baptized. Amen. Just before we close out this Sunday word, uh, just a couple of things that I just want to share with our church family. Uh, again, we just want to continue to keep the family of Sister uh, Velma, Sister Velma Winston in our prayers, continue to keep her family in prayer. Amen. As you know, uh, we laid her to rest on yesterday, so we want to just continue praying.